Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, today we have Russell all the way from Melbourne. Uh, Russell has more than 10 years experience in the field of renewable energy. He is a founding member of the Clean Energy uh, Council of Australia. And he now works for the Melbourne, city of Melbourne, uh, what is it? City of Melbourne. And he's focusing on the target of, very nice target of 25% renewable by 2018. And he agreed to come all the way to speak with us about that, so it will be great talk. Please welcome Russell. Thanks, Steve. Thanks for the uh, the warm introduction. Um, so this is not going to be a um, presentation with one single uh, graph in it. It's really kind of high level. We're going to go across the programs uh, of what we have and what we're doing at the mo moment, and we're going to have a look at our targets of um, what we're actually trying to achieve in, in the coming years. Um, so I'm a part of the Urban Sustainability Branch, which now has uh, 40 members in it, looking at things like um, climate adaptation, water adaptation, um, looking at uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency programs. Uh, and also now we've just uh, aligned with uh, another branch where we're looking at the, the landscapes and trying to double the tree canopy in um, the city of Melbourne. So from 20% to 40% coverage uh, right across the city, which is a huge project. Um, but, uh, so I mentioned zero net emissions. So our, our zero net emissions strategy is um, to basically have uh, net emissions, uh, zero net emissions by 2020. Uh, the policy has been in place for some time um, and we've still got a ways to go. As far as the actual City of Melbourne um, is concerned, like just ourselves, our organisation, we've already achieved that target because we're offsetting. So we're purchasing offsets. But as far as a city goes, you know, we still have a long way um, to get there. And then coming under the, the zero net emissions um, banner is our renewable energy target, which is 25% by 2018. So 25% of electricity coming from renewable energy by 2018, um, which is kind of like a really, uh, audacious goal that we have. Um, currently, uh, towards that target, we're only at 10%. Um, so we still have that sort of delta of 15% to, to get towards the target. And that's, that's quite challenging. I'm going to get into, we're going to touch on um, the programs that we have underway, which we're actually uh, moving towards the 25%. But at the very end, we're going to save questions uh, for the very end. And I'm actually interested if, you know, throw your questions at me because this is really about a conversation. This isn't me just standing up here and presenting, although we'll keep the questions to the end. Uh, I'm interested in starting a conversation because we need to learn from the community, from institutions, from partners, uh, and from the wealth of experience at all different levels, how we can achieve our target because it is quite large and we have a sense of urgency within the city, but we also have some uh, anxiety perhaps in trying to get there because we don't have all the answers. So 25% looks like, what it will look like in uh, 2018 is basically 1.3 million megawatt hours of electricity. So that's uh, basically, we expect and we predict that there'll be 5.2 million megawatt hours uh, per annum of consumption. Uh, and so the target is how do we, how do we get renewables worth 1.3 million megawatt hours? Now, if you put it, that into perspective, to give it some kind of context, that would be the equivalent of 720 megawatt worth of solar systems on our rooftops in the city of Melbourne. And I have to say, we don't have that many rooftops. It's not possible. We initially thought we had about 20 megawatt worth of rooftops. Um, and now the thinking is, is that we, we might have 60 megawatts worth of systems, uh, potential uh, rooftops for systems. Um, which leaves you know, a huge delta gap. So if that's the case, and we know that the conversion rate of getting businesses, um, you know, small and medium enterprise, uh, businesses, residents, um, and even corporates to take up renewables is actually quite a tough path. Um, so it's gonna have to come from somewhere else. And I'll get into that where we think it might come from. But we know that Google as an organization, 34% uh, of um, their electricity is sourced from renewables. Now, they're essentially consuming, well, in 2010, more than 2 million megawatt hours of electricity, um, and 34% is coming from uh, renewables. So we, we kind of figure if they can do it, so can we. Like, that's our attitude. 
And we have an excellent um, Lord Mayor that is completely behind our targets and our uh, Councillor for Environment. And that's extremely important because not all councils have that kind of heavyweight support behind sustainability and renewals. Um, and essentially, like our branch has you know, now doubled, tripled in size to what it originally was because of the efforts of council to really get behind. And they realised through when we did our uh, strategies around uh, zero net emissions, they realised that really we weren't uh, we weren't resourced in the in the right kind of way to actually get um, anywhere near that kind of target. So now we have uh, pretty much 20 staff dedicated towards zero net emissions, and then there was the other 20 that is dedicated towards you know tree canopies of the city, etc. Um, so if we look at the approach. So really, we've got the segmented approach. We've got the residential solar side of things, um, and I'm going to get into what that looks like. Um, we've got the commercial, industrial, you know, small, medium enterprise side of things, uh, and then we have the large-scale renewable energy side, you know, for the corporates and the institutions, um, and that could be a mix of wind, solar, biomass. But clearly, if we're doing something large, it's not going to happen within our uh, area, within our council boundaries because obviously urban density, there's nowhere to put those sort of large systems. But we know that if we don't tackle something on a large scale, we'll never get to our 25% target. It just it wouldn't happen. Um, and then the other thing that happens is green power offsetting. And it's a little bit unique green power. Um, the brand has been around a very long time. When it first came out, it was quite popular. Um, now as, as electricity retailers have diversified their portfolios, um, now that they're looking at, um, you know, sort of potential green options themselves or branding themselves in a green way, green power has started to fall behind and quite a long way. Um, but at the moment, um, it's kind of like a little bit of a stopgap in the city that, you know, going towards that 25% target, green power is actually pay, uh, playing a significant role. And we have a hope that, uh, and I'm meeting with uh, New South Wales State Government tomorrow and City of Sydney, that perhaps green power might be something that helps to get us towards that target if um, a few things happen along the way. Um, because we need to be able to penetrate our marketplace, our customers, residents, we need to be able to get to more residents um, easily, you know, and we don't want projects that take a very long time because we'll never get to the target. Uh, and small, medium enterprise, you know, we need something that can maybe even just be signed off on quickly. But I'll get into it, what that looks like. So we just finished um, some more market research. Um, we've done a, a few different uh, pieces in the last sort of six months. This one came out, uh, I think it was in August, end of August. Um, the challenge that we have with organisations, that 72% of them don't own their own buildings. That, and that's what we call the split incentive. So how do you get around, how do you work with organisations that don't even own the premises that they're in? So if they're, um, if they're just a tenant, essentially you've got to go through a landlord, you might have to go through an owner's corporation, you may need to get 75% approval from the other businesses, and I'll get into what that looks like for some of the, um, uh, the businesses in the City of Melbourne. Um, and so that's, that's quite a challenge. We also know that um, often spoke about in the industry is that industry often comes back to us and says we need money i.e incentives and rebates now there's a lot of debate about this um, a lot of the industry will say no we need to move away from that but often we still hear it that um, that you know we need to have a cash splash to just get this traction thing happening in the market to get renewables penetrating deeper into the market but then when you when you survey these organizations and this is like a, a very you know I guess you would call a st statistically significant spread across uh, the city of Melbourne, 57% 50 of organisations came back and said um, that it was environmental responsibility that they were interested in most. Okay, so it's not, it's not the, um, just the reducing of electricity bills which came in at 54%. Obviously so close, you know, you could barely split them, but it's significant because often we think that, well, 90% are going to come back and say, you know, we just want to have the business case stack up for solar. Now in this space, you have to have a look at, there's a few things playing out here. One is, is that commercial solar is still somewhat in its infancy within Australia and certainly within the city of Melbourne. That's certainly playing out. Um, and you have to also sort of appreciate, I guess, that, you know, 69% of organisations haven't even considered solar. 
So often we think that a large number of you know, organisations have, but in the case, no, and 41% of residents haven't considered solar either. And the challenge we have is getting to those residents and those businesses with, and one of the number one feedback um, things that I always have come back to me is, we find it hard to get credible, reliable information. You know, where do you get that from? Do, you, do businesses and residents feel like they're just getting sold to? You know, and often that's the case. And when that happens, you get overloaded. You've got you know, four or five businesses pounding the pavement and saying, we have the best solution. And by the way, you know, we have the best quality and the best service you know, going around. Well, everyone says that. Um, so what is the role of council? And the role of council is to bring some cred you know, credibility to that situation and be an unbiased voice. We know we have targets to work towards, but we developed those targets in collaboration with the community. The community helped guide us towards a 25% target because it was fed back to us that that's what they wanted. Uh, and obviously as an organisation, we drove that towards that as well. So we have some challenges. At the moment, um, we do have some um, uh, geographical information system tools that we work with to then target out to our um, customers. Um, so we're an organisation, we're kind of run like a corporation. You have two parts of, you know, you have the Melbourne City Council and then you have the City of Melbourne and then there are some existing tools in place which need further development. Um, but what we have so far is uh, looking at, you know, the constraints. So if we have a look at um, what rooftops, and this is just a small slice around the CBD, um, you know, if there's a, like the, the bright green is low constraint, um, automatically we know, and this is done through computer modelling, um, okay, that's maybe is something we can start to look at. Obviously a highly constrained roof you don't want anything to do with because um, we don't have the resources uh, and it's just not going to be suitable. Um, but we look at, you know, um, to come to that, so the, the algorithms, you know, behind this are looking at overshadowing um, and looking at obstacles on roofs, uh, you know, roof height and rooftop square metres, obstructions, all that kind of stuff. So that's built into it. Um, and that helps formulate our campaigns out to the market because we will do face-to-face um, -face campaigns, um, information sessions, we'll go out to business parks, etc. Um, insulation maps, um, so you know, again looking at the available uh, you know, kilowatt hours per square metre. Um, and again when we do our campaigns we'll look at sort of targeted areas, we'll look at um, you know, somewhere in the northwest that we know just has lots of beautiful roofs um, that are open. The other thing that we look at is um, planning overlays. So obviously as a city we need to really investigate um, what's going to happen in the next 20 years within that area. And we can't by all rights go to you know, businesses and say, hey, solar's a great opportunity, knowing full well that it might get built out because there's a potential overlay issue where you know, buildings can go up to 20 metres in height and it's just going to um, shade. And the other thing that we look at, and we have you know, sort of a dedicated staff member, is uh, towards, we look at the, the solar access. Now this is where it gets a little bit complicated, because in solar access, um, essentially we're going through uh, amendments within planning regulations to, to you know, look right at the access and what are the rights for residents and building owners, etc. Highly complex, and it actually takes years to get through. Um, I didn't personally appreciate local government uh, coming from the private sector. Uh, you know, I appreciate it enough because I've worked in private sector, things happen quickly, you can punch you know, projects through, you can kind of make things, you know, you're highly flexible, you can chop and change, you, you can kind of get stuff done quickly. But local government doesn't work like that, uh, or state government or federal government. You, know, you, have to, um, you have to go through high governance, you have to go through probity, you have to make sure the regulations are met, the legalities are met. There are a whole host of different things, you know, procurement, you know, if you're dealing with public funds, it takes a long time and you have to get it right because you, ha you, you can't afford to churn if it's a regulation. Now, as far as the um, overshadowing, you know, we've started to sort of try and think about what, what that might look like and potential tools that, you know, might be uh, suitable for us to, to maybe try and make something available to the public, but it's a work in progress and that's, uh, you know, certainly something we need to speak to, you know, UNSW about to look at, well, as we're making these planning regulation changes, um, how do we provide tools to raise the profile for the public and make it highly visible what you can and can't do and the opportunities. Uh, and then we move on to like an energy yield map 
okay, looking at, um, you know, by building, um, now that's not, it's taking into account, um, you know, some of the other uh, uh, data that's in those other maps. Um, but again, it's fairly generalistic. Uh, and we would hope that in the near future we can make some of this, you know, publicly available. Um, because that's not just for our benefit, it's got to be for the benefit of all. Um, and, you know, these are kind of like, almost like a beta version, um, you know, working with our GIS team internally to try and develop, you know, some tools. Um, but again, looking at what areas of, of the city are, are suitable. You can already see that some of the blue and sort of yellow areas, um, you know, you're starting to work around the CBD. So you're getting, you know, your low um, kilowatt hours per year returns in those areas. Understandable. I mean, that just goes without saying. You start to get out of the CBD and then it starts to open up. But as a capital city, so we look at a capital city approach to re renewable energy, we have a challenge. We've got a CBD. You know, you've got tall buildings, you've got skyscrapers. It's not so easy. If you go out into the regional areas or into the council areas around where we are, um, that becomes easy because you just don't have to deal with, you know, 60 story um, skyscrapers. And so our, our potential for renewables is limited, but we still have some good options, but we just have to be very targeted in, in our approach. So now looking at those different sort of segment areas. So the, the market research formulates how we go to market. You know, you do your market research, you, you get the voice of the customer to help uh, formulate um, what your programs are. Um, using some you know, tools to help understand where areas might be suitable that we can start to look at. And then we start to break it down into the different segments. So looking at residential, recently we just finished a bulk buy program. Now, the bulk buy program, again, used um, some of those tools to help target the areas that we thought were most suitable. But the other advantage that a, a council have is our rates database. So rates database has all this kind of cool information on it. You know, it's got, um, is that building you know, owner occupied? Well, that's really handy to know. Is it a tenant in there? You know, what's the net lettable uh, area of that building space? You know, there's a whole host of different pieces of information that we can take out uh, and then help formulate where we put our energy and resources. Because uh, resources, like any council, are always tight. Uh, and we're typically under-resourced. Um, being, you know, uh, like I sit in a strategy team, so we have lots of ideas. Uh, and you have to be very prioritised, not to just run away with every idea you have. But if we have a look at what did this particular program look like, um, so we had a bulk buy arrangement. Um, now, as a council, due to probity, you know, regulation sort of issues, um, there's, there's a lot of things that we can't do. So we need partners to be able to go out to the market and facilitate stuff to happen. Positive Charge is part of the Moreland Energy Foundation uh, and the Moreland uh, Council very well regarded and well known within Australia as a, as a leading council. They have a very green um, electorate that they sit within. Um, and so the targeted campaign went out to 4,000 uh, residents. Now there's a lot more residents than that, um, but these were residents that we, you know, houses that we thought would be probably most suitable. And you know, it's the low hanging fruit. Now of those 4,000, we generated 300 leads. Okay, great, so now we've got some leads to work with. The challenge that we then had was that 18% of those leads were highly constrained rooftops. So you come back to your constraints again, so what, what happens then? And we look at, well, how do we reach those re residents? Like, how do you actually get them into action to make it a priority? Now, some people, as we know, like 41% of residents haven't heard about the solar opportunity before. Okay, so, Oddly enough, there's this funny thing that happens within council, direct mail. You know, you would think in this age of technology and, and social media and the web and all that kind of stuff going on, that a savvy kind of internet campaign would get your biggest bang for buck, but it doesn't. Um, web is kind of down the bottom. When you're a council, and I hate to say it, it's snail mail, postal mail that still gets your highest returns. Because people trust, they see a letter from council, they're like, I better pick that up and I better action it because it could be, you know, like a, a fine, it could be a rates notice, like I need to have a look at this. And then they open it up and, you know, we had uh, um, something signed by um, our councillor for the environment, so a very formal letter signed by him. Uh, and they're like, okay, well, this is interesting. And so that was then backed up with um, a door knock campaign. So face-to-face, -face, generating more interest, and then phone calls, et cetera. 
so there's, there's a lot of touch that happens. <coughs> Out of that, uh, we essentially had a 13% conversion rate and 102.5 kilowatt installed, 40 systems. Not bad. Would we have liked more? Yeah, of course we want more, because if we get to get towards our 25% target, that's like a barely a scratch on the bonnet of the car. You know, we need more than that. But it's, what's interesting is one of the things we've now learnt is that market segment is now saturated. It's saturated. We can't go back to it in six months time or even potentially a year because they've already heard from us through postal mail, door knocks, phone calls, web. We've saturated that market. So now we've just kind of knocked out our residential game side of things somewhat. And that's kind of one part of the thinking. What I would say is though, that we also know that there are other target areas that we need to start looking at, which is low income housing and social housing. So these are some of our next target areas. And when I say it's saturated, what I'm really referring to is those particular residents that we targeted, that's not, we don't want to go back to them immediately because you have to remember from a council point of view, it's not just renewables that we go to them for. When I talk about saturation, there's a whole host of different things that they get information from us about. And yeah, of course it's rates and it's you know, waste and there's a whole host of different things going on. So we can't just keep hitting them from different departments you know, all month long. So we have to get smart about it. If we look at commercial solar, so looking at another segment area, um, again, we've had to partner with uh, Vecchi, who is the Victorian employer of uh, uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, uh, so they can actually do the stuff that we can't do as a council, um, which is you know, do business assessments and you know, compare quotes and all that kind of stuff, because we can't be biased in the market in any way, but we can employ uh, another sort of un unbiased partner to do that work for us. And we've worked with various organisations over the years. Um, and we just ran a, a commercial solar rebate program, um, which I was in charge of. And so essentially, you know, we had money out to businesses. We did a whole host of even barbecue events. You know, we're doing barbecues with marquees. We were doing information sessions. Um, we had, uh, you know, all our corporate channels and the social media was uh, marketed to. Um, we even did a, a dedicated phone campaign. We did, you know, the, the direct mail. Um, oddly enough, it was the direct mail campaign that got all the leads. Again, um, really interesting. So um, I wouldn't have thought that. In the end, that solar rebates campaign generated 132 kilowatts of system. Yeah, it's okay. It's pretty good. We're proud of that. We certainly wanted more, but the real objective for that program wasn't just putting solar on rooftops. It's actually understanding the customer, the drivers and the barriers um, for our customers. That's kind of like what we need to understand more because there's always this gray area of what makes uh, renewables, uh, especially a priority for, um, you know, for a resident or a business. Like, what makes it a priority? What makes them sort of stand up and say, no, I'm not gonna just you know, put that letter in the bin. I'm actually gonna do something about it today. Um, and again, you know, these campaigns came out of insulation maps and pretty simplistic, you know, there's various ones out there, APVR, et cetera, you know, um, that have something very similar um, and our rates database um, and working with our program partners. So looking at, again, at like say the finance side of things, um, environmental upgrade agreements. So if you're unaware of what that is, um, essentially it's a, a a rates mechanism to pay back the cost of a solar system through your rates payments. And you can do that over 10 years. So that's kind of pretty cool. Um, Sustainable Melbourne Fund is like our funding arm of the um, of City of Melbourne who facilitates that. But the challenge is, is that, again, 44% of businesses aren't aware of EUAs. And that's not for lack of trying. So again, it's trying to get the message out there that there are these different methods, there's certainly like City of Melbourne can get behind um, solar to help businesses go solar and make that easy. Um, and we can provide finance, like organised finance through, you know, our funding arm. Um, but again, you know, getting to the, the decision makers is very hard. Um, so if you're talking about building owners, like a lot of building owners within City of Melbourne, they live overseas. You know, the, those groups are within Singapore, for example. How do you get to a business in Singapore? Yeah, sometimes, you know, we've tried mailing to them, emailing, doesn't mean you get a response. So that becomes very hard in saying, well, actually, we do have something available for your business, but
But you know, we, we sort of have to go to the ones that we know are probably owner occupying, not just owning. 83% of businesses thought they would be more likely um, to proceed if they could pay off their system over time. Well, that's kind of interesting. So, you know, a lot of them are saying, well, maybe that's an option. Now, the, the, the challenge with data is that it often conflicts, you know, in some ways, because, you know, this particular survey was separate from the other survey. So the market, you know, solar attitudes and community research survey that we did. And in essence, the other one sort of said, well, 57% of uh, organisations thought that the number one driver, you know, was kind of environmental responsibility. And then 54% said, you know, they want to reduce the running costs of their business. And another percentage sort of came back and said, well, they would probably be likely to just fund it themselves. So you do get conflicts. And obviously it depends on the size of the, of the data set. Um, in the other data set, it was 181 businesses that responded to that and went through quite a lengthy um, interview for that survey. Um, but again, okay, so getting the message out there that we have something available. And we take them through a, you know, a value proposition. I won't sort of dwell on that too much, but it's kind of like, a, like what a business would do. You know, we make sure that it's kind of like the seamless approach. Before I arrived, you know, it, we were still getting up and running. So how do you get a, a, a customer to move from here to there um, when you have nothing to sell? We've got nothing. You know, we're just kind of council. You know, it's kind of easy if you've got this widget and you're like, hey, it's really cool. Like, it'll change your life. You know, um, this thing will make you, you know, that much more efficient in the work that you do. And, but when you have nothing to sell, you're kind of selling a concept uh, and it's a very worthy concept. Um, so we look at, well, there's some very obvious things, you know, improving the running costs or the position of the business with running costs, you know, reducing electricity bills, um, impacting the environment. A unique one is differentiating the business. So a lot of businesses start to look the same after a while. How do you stand out in a crowded marketplace? Well, some businesses will take the green approach. And I've got a case study that I'll show you in a moment about a business that is doing just that. I'm trying to pop out to their, to their customers to, to say that we're different than the rest. And we have a lot of social you know, responsibility and environmental responsibility that we take you know, very highly. Um, the ROI, the re, you know, return on investment needs to be good, hopefully, but sometimes it's not. I mean, if you have a look at, through the solar rebates program, we just had a business that went through that and had an 11 year payback on their system. Well, that's a lot higher than you would normally think. A lot of commercial businesses want kind of like three to five years. Well, they really want two to three years, but you might be able to stretch them for, for three to five. Um, and the challenge is once you start going sort of seven, eight, nine, ten then they sort of say, well, you know, this whole environmental thing, we're right behind it, but just we don't have the, the funds to do it. Um, City of Melbourne helps a lot with PR and marketing for these systems. So, you know, we have various launches, like when, when a system gets installed, like if it's, a, say, a 30 kilowatt solar system, we'll get right behind it. We will have, um, like, Media Splash um, and, you know, get it right out there into the market because we're getting behind these businesses to present them as a solar leader in their community to really help them stand out and helping, helping them go through the journey with their own sort of staff and their customers. What we found is successful is peer-to-peer -peer engagement. So the lady there on the, the top right is Liz Fenwick, absolute superstar champion. This lady is unbelievable. She, her business is an electrical um, engineering business, sits within a, a business park of 100 businesses. And she's such a champion that she needed 75% approval from her owner's corporation to install a system on her own roof. So she owns the building, but it's kind of like a two-level uh, two building and she owns one level, but not both. And the rooftop areas are seen as common area. So that, like, wow, that gets really hard. A lot of people and most people just kind of stop at that and just go, this is really time consuming. But she went door knocking to 100 businesses uh, she went to her owner's corporation meetings and sort of only 10 people turn up to those. You know, so you only get a, a few through that. And she literally got 75% approval. So now what she does is, so we did a, a, a barbecue launch at her um, premises. We got the, um, one of the councillors involved. And now she speaks to other businesses on our behalf, just through the sheer passion she has for the environment and getting the message out there. 
And then what she's also done is she's broken down the barrier because it's actually the 75% owner's corporation approval isn't necessarily like a hard and fast, you know, regulated kind of rule. Now that's, you know, to be investigated, but in her case, she managed to get total um, widespread approval for any business that now wants to get it approved within that business park. And so that's kind of like the next target of getting those businesses up and running. That's kind of really cool. So early adopters always are champions. You know, they're ultra greens. There's a small percentage of ultra greens and she's a champion. And without her, you know, we wouldn't be so successful. And we actually have many of these champions now and we call them our solar leaders. And they, at any stage, you know, we can call, call them up and say, look, the business down the road's quite interested. Would you mind having a conversation? And they typically don't mind, you know, spending 15 minutes out of their day, once in a blue moon, to kind of have a, have a chat. Um, and again, we come back to, well, things that are successful are the credible, reliable information, taking the customers through that journey, you know, um, making sure that the hand is held from start to finish. Um, and, but we come against that barrier of, is it a priority for businesses? So often a business will say, we've got a four year payback. And we think that's amazing, you know, four year payback on a solar system, awesome, good to go. And the business kind of just says, yeah, but you know, we kind of had a little bit of a down quarter in our, you know, in the financials for the business and we might come back to it next year. And we think, wow, you seem so enthusiastic. We've been speaking for three months, what happened? You know, and it, they just fall off the radar. We've had like 450 kilowatt systems, like that close to getting signed off by the board, uh, gone, it's just gone. Um, and right down to small systems as well. So the question that we have, and I do not have the answer to this, I've spent kind of almost 10 years of my life trying to figure this out. What is that game changer value besides value proposition and business proposition? Because all that stacks up and customers don't go ahead. Now, again, like council has nothing to sell, but we have a target. We've got a 25% renewable energy target and we're really committed to that. What is this other thing? And we've got a whole host of ideas, you know, like maybe it's, um, maybe it's getting some, you know, educational opportunities for the business and their staff of things that we're linked to or internal mechanisms that we have within the city of Melbourne and they can access that. Some like some, you know, we have all kinds of um, training that happens, health training and, you know, leadership training. Maybe they can get some of that too if they become, get a solar system and become a solar leader. Um, it's got to be something else. And I think the, the industry at large grapples with that. Okay. So, moving on. So, completely out of the blue, kind of just a little bit cool thing that happened, we just received 31,000 signatures for our commercial solar rebate program and our, you know, uh, climate change works that we're doing in general, but specifically towards the commercial solar. Didn't see that coming. Um, it was not nothing that we did, it just arrived one day. So the community gets behind it. I mean, there is still great sort of enthusiasm and interest and it's our constant challenge about how we garner that interest. That's our Lord Mayor on the right, and that's our Councillor Aaron Wood on the left, and that's uh, uh, Climate Council representative in the middle. And uh, I wasn't there uh, that day because I wasn't invited to that one, but that's okay. Um, moving on, so we have program partners. So Sustainable Melbourne Fund, already mentioned them. If a business needs finance, it's possible. Um, uh, the Victorian Employers Chamber of Commerce and Industry, VECI, they do our assessments, so do like feasibility assessments, can get quotes through the Clean Energy Council of Australia and the Code of Conduct approved retailers. Um, so they do an, like a request for a quote out to the market and then they get responses back and put it through a matrix and come out with a final three and do the quote comparison for the business. So we've taken a customer, like trying to make it as seamless as possible just to say, You've now got quotes, all you need to do is make a decision. The payback will be there, the internal rate of return will be there, the net present value will be there, you know, your return on investment, all that is highlighted to them and all they have to do is kind of sign on the dotted line of a quote. Pretty easy. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do with some of our other energy efficiency programs as well. So a little quick case study. Um, 60 kilowatt system getting installed today as we speak, as long as it's not raining because it's 56 stories up and it's really windy up there and I was up there a couple of weeks ago and it's kind of um, quite interesting. If you look at the, the image on the, uh, the top right and you've got that little spire, the tower, the system is like a, a kind of like a little, you know, part of the building just below that tower. Well, that's the bottom left picture 
where the, the solar system is getting installed. It's vertical orientation because there's a huge amount of wind up there. And they tried to initially do something different, like maybe there's a flat section, you know, put the panels down and tilt them at 10 degrees or whatever it might be. And the wind loading was just kind of extreme and the building, you know, just wouldn't approve it. So they've just had to go through a, a highly costly uh, engineering piece to then re-engineer all the steel work around that, you know, structure and then put the panels there. And, you know, you put them at vertical, typically your figure of, you know, percentage loss is 38%. Okay, they have to wear that because they don't really have a choice and they've got nowhere else to put the panels and they really want to do it. Awesome. Um, so is it the highest solar system in the Southern Hemisphere, like on a building? Um, we kind of believe it is. We don't know. If someone you know, knows otherwise, please tell us because we're going to do a lot of media around this. Um, but you know, we're happy to be told otherwise. But we just think it's really cool for a premium building in the city of Melbourne, 101 Collins, if you're not aware of it, is like kind of Melbourne's absolute premium, you know, building. It is where the high-end legal firms and, um, you know, finance, et cetera, they're all in there. That's where you go. It's now 25 years old, so there's some other, you know, buildings as well, but it's still seen as like, you know, the Paris end of Melbourne. Um, and, you know, the building's actually four-star neighbours rating, which is kind of also cool. Um, and you know, you've got some high quality products being installed and we provided uh, an incentive to help uh, install that system, just as we did for any other business that wanted to, um, to go solar. So that's kind of really cool and you'll see that in the media in the coming months. Uh, just another quick one, you know, it's just a little 30 kilowatt system. Um, but what's unique about it, so FM FMSA architecture, these guys are incredible. I mean, they've now got their building at five star neighbours rating before they went solar. So that maybe, maybe they'll get up to five and a half stars, maybe, neighbours rating. Um, but even these guys, like, you know, they've got a 3.8 year payback on the system, which is, like, really? 3.8 years? That's incredible. You know, in the, in the solar industry, it's gone up and down. And now, you know, it's kind of come down again. Like, I've seen prices drop dramatically in the, in the last couple of months. Um, but what's kind of cool about these guys is that they just stuck to their guns and did it, but it took them months. Solar is a long lead time in the commercial space. It takes a long time to get things through. But they stuck to their guns and they did it. And look at that. So that's North Melbourne. Looking back at the city, it's beautiful. Um, and so now they have become like a solar leader and are willing to champion the cause to other businesses and organisations. So, on to the, the big project. So this is our large scale renewable energy project called the Melbourne Renewable Energy Project. REP, it's not the best acronym, but it, um, it's an awesome project. And what we're doing here in this segment is we're aggregating demand from corporates. So big business, getting uh, 100 gigawatt hours worth of demand, and then taking it to drive investment in uh, new large scale renewable energy projects. And these are shovel ready projects that are ready to go. So they've already been designed, developed, they've got, you know, potential, um, uh, you know, in installation companies and maybe some potential finance and what they really need is an offtake agreement. And that's what's hard because there's actually a whole bunch of wind farms and a whole bunch of solar farms on the shelf gathering dust because no one uh, is willing to sign up to, you know, that sort of takeoff agreement. Um, and that's where we step in to facilitate that conversation. So, you know, these are just images of what it might look like. Um, but again, we now have, it's around 12 uh, organisations, and you're talking like Mervac, multi-billion dollar uh, organisation, um, you know, Federation Square, which is an iconic, you know, uh, space in Melbourne, um, other councils, we've got Moreland Council, uh, City of Yarra, uh, and there's uh, uh, Next DC, who's like an amazing data centre, like these are our, this is our real solar champion, who've installed a 400 kilowatt system within our boundaries on their data centre and are willing to get behind all our projects. Incredible company. Um, and so we've got the demand. Um, and as we did our market research, like what that might look like, what, what would a project look like? We sent it out to an RFI and we had a huge response. Like a we had rooms, you know, six, seven times this size packed to the rafters and lots of media around it. Um, and a lot of proposals, or high level proposals came back about what that might mean biogas, you know, wind, solar, all kinds of interesting things. When we looked at something like green power, the research said that it's expensive and an outdated brand. And that's something that we need to look at um, 
in other projects, but it's not going to feed into this project, um, we believe, at this point. Um, that tender is expected to go out this financial year. And it could mean, uh, it could mean a 30 megawatt wind farm, or it could be like a 60, 65 megawatt um, solar farm. Now clearly that's not going to happen down at Port Melbourne on the beach. It's got to happen outside our boundaries, um, and it could happen, you know, hopefully within Victoria to keep it local. Um, but what we're really hoping to do is replicate the model. That's where the real juice is in this program. Now, if we get one you know, of these systems installed within our target of you know, by 2018, we'll be doing really well. Um, so we're not gonna probably you know, replicate within that time frame, although some things might happen in parallel. Um, but there is a lot of effort being put into this right now, and we've already got the industry, uh, or the organisations behind us. And again, you know, you've got Bank Australia, formerly Bank MECU, Citywide, Mervac, I mean, you know, and there's more. There's, these are the publicly announced ones. There's others. And this is like the first of its kind in Australia. Other group purchasing has been done, but not in this utility scale framework um, in this regard. So it's the first of its kind. Um, and so, you know, a question was asked earlier today, well, what about, you know, reverse auction, like what's been happening in, in Canberra, you know, the ACT? Um, what about an, a reverse auction mechanism and that really gets your price down um, and, it, you know, it's kind of quite a competitive sort of process. I think, you know, we didn't look at that because um, this idea has actually been in gestation for actually some time and we think it's a, a, it's a winner for this model. That model's a winner as well. It's a fantastic model. But, you know, we think this is also a good thing. The challenge becomes it's only 1% towards our target. You, you wouldn't have thought. So when I first heard about this program, I was like, oh, that's going to be much more. Well, we've got 10% already in the mix. That huge project is 1%. Anything that we do on rooftops, like let's face it, if we get another megawatt worth of rooftop solar systems within the city of Melbourne, we'd be pretty happy and it's still not going to scratch the surface. So we've got a delta of 14%. Now the real conversation comes from how are we going to get there? Now, we don't have enough time to really sort of go into that today, but that's what I'm sort of interested for feedback on. And we'll get to some um, you know, questions in a moment. Um, that we're trying to work out. I mean, that is a hard nut to crack. Um, and there's lots of ideas. I mean, certainly we need to tap into, you know, social housing and low income housing, potentially refresh the green power brand, community solar, you know, we're having those discussions about community projects. And there's a bunch of stuff that we can do. Um, it's just what resources do we have to be able to do it? What time do we have? Um, can we do it within the tight time frames? Uh, and is it going to get us our biggest you know, return for investment? How are we going to achieve it? Solar power trams, don't know if anyone saw that. You know, a company came out with the idea about offsetting you know, with a solar farm all of Melbourne's trams. That's kind of pretty cool. Um, being investigated, I guess. Is it going to be, you know, funky uh, wind trees and you know solar trees like you know some of these images in the middle we're, we're actually investigating that too but that's kind of like the public awareness i mean that's not that's barely a scratch on the surface um is it going to be 40 percent efficient solar cells out of unsw um you would hope so in the coming years um to make you know better use of our rooftops um and that's going to be a part of it you know we need technology to, to come up with solutions that are going to make this job easier. And it certainly comes down to state government as well. I mean, we've just fed into the um, Renewable Energy Roadmap submission uh, in the last sort of few weeks. And it's got to come from state government, which will naturally flow back into um, the city. But we're trying to drive it because when you see lack of federal support for renewables and uh, state level support, like the previous Victorian government was um, you know, was sort of a little bit close to business for all renewables, um, that, that's where a, a capital city steps in and takes charge and says, right, we're going to lead from the, the front of the pack. So just to quickly summarise, um, we have our target. It's a hairy, audacious target. Not easily achieved and we don't have all the answers to get there. And we're looking for the bright minds in this room um, to help us. So, you know, certainly ask some questions at the end. But also, um, if you want to get in touch with myself, um, you know, through Linda here in the front, that's one method. I'll actually leave some business cards on the table. Anyone that wants to contact us, you know, and, and have this discussion, totally open to that because we need to do it in collaboration. Um, 
because we've got to get, reduce that 15% delta. We have our various programs and we're in the process of integrating our programs. So, you know, with energy efficiency, we have three major programs in 1200 buildings, City Switch and Smart Blocks, and I don't have time to go into all of those. But as our branch has grown and as the City of Melbourne's targets have grown to be, you know, bold um, and sustainable and inspirational within our city, um, you know, essentially, we need to have a very seamless approach out to the market. And there's a whole host of sort of factors that, you know, in our suite of offerings to our customers that need to be considered. We have some mapping tools, but we need more, you know, and that's something that, you know, we can certainly discuss with um, UNSW. Uh, and we have some ground breaking projects and, and unique projects happening. Um, that's interesting, it raises the level of awareness. Um, but certainly we, we need to do more of that. And then the final point, which is the collaboration that we don't pretend like we have all the answers, you know, we uh, are open for discussions. So um, those are my details if you want to get in contact. But I would now put it to the floor to see if anyone has any interesting questions. I'll answer what I can and what I can't answer, I'll take offline and get back to you on. So thank you very much. Any Sorry, you're at 10% now, what's yes. that made up of? So 1% is green power in the, the general mix, oh, well, you know, specifically in the city of Melbourne. 9% is you know, upstream uh, renewables feeding in, like uh, hydro and wind, etc. And uh, a small percentage is rooftop solar. So it's kind of the cheeky 10%. Okay. And the hard work is, and, and you can see like that large scale project, I mean, you've got like a team of three, yeah almost full time on it within our organisation, but we have about eight or nine departments working on it as well. Yes, so, I, I yeah. asked that question because clearly, you know, it's easy perhaps to build on what you've already learned, but that, yeah. you know, it, that if buying in more isn't actually going to solve that, I don't think. I, like from a green power point of view? Uh, yeah. Just, I, and how to get from 10% to 25%, you know, yeah. and I presume you looked at, at that, I just wanted to know what it looked like, so, because yeah, yeah. I did a quick study um, and Melbourne has, Melbourne local government area has two megawatts of PV at the moment. Um, Brisbane local government area has 270. Mm. They have three times the uh, number of residences. Yeah. But that's, you know, there's, so it shows you what can, so they have 25% uh, of the residences yeah. with solar on their roof, whereas Melbourne has two. So there's, yeah, <laughs> there's yeah, five, five percent. So Melbourne has five percent. So there's a potential there if you can yeah. engage with those residences. And I'm interested. Clearly in Brisbane, <coughs> that was the feed-in tariffs yes. that drove that. But maybe there are mechanisms like that that yeah. communicated. And then I think the experience that we've noticed is in places like in Brisbane is that it's just, there's a snowball effect. When people start to see solar on, you know, three of their neighbours' rooftops, they actually think, oh, you know, I'm missing out on something here. This yeah. is, you know, they're, it's working and, and these people are winning. And Absolutely. And I've worked in that retail space for um, you know, seven or eight years. And you can certainly stand on some rooftops and see 20 systems. The challenge that we have, and, and you're absolutely right, like there is a lot to learn from. I'm actually meeting with City of Sydney tomorrow, and we should certainly meet with uh, City of Brisbane. We have at best, we believe, 60 megawatt of rooftop potential. That's our, that's our upper limit. And maybe you know, between 20 and 60, that's part of the challenge. And we have a highly constrained rooftop. You know, Melbourne's quite an old city. Um, and highly constrained roofs. So yes, you can use micro inverters and you can do some really interesting things, but you know, you have multifaceted roofs that are really hard to work with. Uh, and like that sort of residential program, 18% were knocked out immediately because of those constraints of, well, that's not immediate, that was of the 300 leads that we generated of the rest that were knocked out. So I think, I think you're right. We need to utilize that more. The challenge is um, how to get that message to the residents. Now, Interesting, and we're almost out of time, but interesting, there are some fantastic programs happening in Melbourne in other council areas, like the Darabin, uh, city of Darabin, and they have a solar savers program. So, you know, you might want to Google that. That's a great program. Uh, I was just thinking on that, I, like, I don't know, because I'm not from either city really, but maybe a perception thing with the weather. In Brisbane, maybe they feel like they have more sun, right. in Melbourne, they just don't realise they might have as much benefit because they don't have as much sun, maybe? Yeah, maybe, maybe we're grumpy in Melbourne because of it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they need to be more aware that they can still get a good benefit, even yeah. though maybe they don't have as much sunlight as Brisbane. I don't know. Well, and we saw that, that there was 41% of residents that weren't even aware of the opportunity. Yeah. You know, so we, we certainly need to penetrate deeper into that market. 
Um, I think what you're doing is great, and I think that the technology is really close. Most of us in the room are technologists and yeah. really keen to see that we know that we can still advance it further, but it's commercially competitive now, the technology is ready. Yeah. A lot of what we have to do now is marketing, and what you're doing is really good in yeah. you know, actually getting the message out and letting people know that it makes sense. And we use guerrilla campaigns too, because we have limited budgets. So we use, we use the industry to help market our programs. So we work very closely, like I, I, you know, I was at the All, uh, All Energy Conference two weeks ago, uh, meeting with a lot of industry, and we meet with them regularly. Uh, I'm you know, the convener for the Australian Solar Council meetings in Melbourne, and it's mainly attended by industry, and I do that uh, every month, I have for the last two years. Um, and we're trying to work with industry to come up with some of these solutions and what's working and what's not. But I'll, I'll go to Muriel up the back. Um, you focus mostly on PV. Have you done anything about solar water heating, energy efficiency, anything else that will yeah. also the reason I focused on um, renewables side of things was because um, that's a specific part of our um, zero net emissions, so the 25% target. But to your point, um, energy efficiency side of things, we have the three programs, 1200 buildings, um, we have city switch, and we have smart blocks. So one smart blocks is for residential strata titled buildings. So really working in, you know, with the common areas of residential high rise. We have um, 1,200 buildings, which targets commercial building owners, so the actual building owners, and then we have um, City Switch, which, tar which targets the tenants. That's energy efficiency. Solar hot water, no, and I can't give you an answer why we haven't, because it actually does come up, and it would be a, a great area to try and reduce emissions. So for the commercial sector, I guess prices or uh, ability to renew contracts for gas becoming an issue, and is that something you could tap into with the solar sector? Yeah, I think so. From a residential point of view, we're, yeah, we're, we're looking at um, maybe some different campaigns, but the, also the challenge is that you know people sort of skip contracts all the time because you've got people door knocking regularly, you know, and then they'll be with one retailer one day and then something the next. But I think it's a definite area we need to focus more on. We're just a little bit under resourced.